Hey guys, today we're looking at a brand new platform from Trek. This is the E Caliber. It's designed after the Super Caliber, which is a non electric, just acoustic cross country racing bike, World Cup level. It's an awesome bike. What they've done to the platform for the electric version is extended the reach a little bit and slacken the head tube angle, make it a little bit less aggressive, a little bit more stable at continuous higher speeds. It is electric. This is class one, up to 20 miles per hour, 32 kilometers per hour. It's a pretty cool bike and it actually comes in five different versions. The base level it costs 6,499. This one's 11,499. So $5,000 difference. You're like, well, what's the difference? Uh, you've got carbon rims here. You don't have alloy rims. You've got XTR derailleur versus XT and upgraded Fox suspension front and rear versus rock shocks. And then a rigid carbon fiber seat post versus a dropper post. So all of this amounts to over five pounds of weight difference between the 6.6 .6 and the 9.9 .9 XTR. And I'm just gonna overlay the other three models here so you can see some of the other components that you're trading off, including the weight differences. And I love how stealthy this thing is. I mean, you look at it and the Fazua motor is just completely hidden. The battery, same thing. Really nice color choices here. This thing does come in four different colorways as well as Trek's Project One program, which lets you customize everything, all the components and do custom paint. If you go with the base level, that's called the 6.8. Um, you only have one color choice and it's sort of this muted gray, which I actually think looks pretty nice, but this is this is very appealing to me. You've got this sort of glossy metallic blue and then it fades into the black and you can even see the carbon here. Trek does a really great job with their carbon and just the geometry and the design of like this rear suspension, for example, there's only one pivot point down here and then there's a shock slide going on and the rest of this just flexes a little bit. You'll notice these narrow seat stays and a little bit thicker chain stays. So you're not getting too much of a change in length here, which could cause the, the chain to sort of bounce a little bit and maybe cause some kickback with your drive system. At 36.6 pounds, as seen here with the pedals on and the, the, the drive pack right here, which includes the motor, and there's like a shaft drive that goes down into that bottom bracket, as well as the battery, this is very, very lightweight, but they also include this empty shell. And this thing only weighs about one pound. You can actually store stuff inside of it. You could put a sandwich in there, some tools, maybe some tire tubes or something like that. We're running tubeless right here, which is totally the way to go. You can run with a little bit lower air pressure and it just lightens the whole thing up. That's the name of the game here. I also happen to have the charger, super, super compact, weighs about 1.4 pounds, only a two amp charger. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but that's not a big deal because the battery capacity on this is 252 watt hours. Now, if you're familiar with the e-bike space, you're probably thinking that's kind of low. Like most batteries are at least 500 watt hours these days, like the Bosch Powerpack 500 or the Powerpack 625. A lot of the other Trek bikes do use Bosch. So it's interesting to see a departure from that with the Fatsua, like super lightweight motor. And this thing is, is quiet, but impressively powerful. Like I looked at this, this motor about a year and a half ago on a Bulls electric bike and there was definitely some room for improvement. Um, you, you know, this thing's offering up to 55 Newton meters of torque and they rate it now from 300 to 450 watts. Uh, back in the day, it was more like, you know, 250 watts and the, the pedal cadence range was a lot more limited. Now I think it can go all the way up to 125 RPM versus before they said 85. And what that means is if you're pedaling at a medium cadence and then you downshift into, you know, a taller ring to give you a little bit fa faster cadence here for climbing, well, your pedal speed picks up. And if the motor can't keep up with you, and then you don't have enough leg power, the bike slows down and you have to downshift again and that speeds up your cadence. And it's this, this like positive feedback loop, which is kind of no fun. Uh, most of the modern day drive systems, whether it's Broza or Yamaha or Shimano or Bosch, they've got that 120 RPM. So it's really nice to see that this new like Black Pepper firmware update for Fatswa, putting them right back into the game. So as I was saying, if you, if you remove this drive pack, 
that thing weighs like six and a half pounds. So you end up with like a 30.1 pound bike. That's how much I weighed this at, again, with the pedals. I have been out and about and I got it muddy and I kind of hosed it down and stuff. So it's, this is all approximate. I am on the medium size frame. This thing comes in four frame sizes. Again, four colors. For, for me, this is still premium. I like Shimano stuff. We've got the two-way trigger shifter up here. I comment on this frequently when reviewing bikes. I've got my fingers up here activating those brake levers, and then I like to use my thumb to shift. Well, you, it's two ways, so you can use your pointer finger or your thumb, but it's nice that you've, you've, you've got that option. A lot of times the SRAM stuff, it's, it's only um, push, which is, is a minor thing. I like that it's got this one-way clutch set up here, so you can uh, unlock it a little bit. It's gonna give you a little bit of flex down here, easier to do drivetrain maintenance, and then you tighten it so you're reducing the bounce and slap. Of course, we do have a really nice slap guard. We've got this metal piece here to protect that uh, chain stay. We've got a narrow wide tooth, 32 tooth chain ring up here, E13. Carbon cranks, that's another one of the upgrades that you're getting with this 9.9 .9 XTR version. It's got these plastic like scuff guards at the end just to keep the frame in good shape. And you'll notice, I mean, this is aluminum alloy, so the area that's gonna take the most contact from like rocks and dirt and stuff, that's all part of the Fatsua drive unit. It's not carbon fiber like the rest of the frame. Another thing that's really impressive in addition to the four sizes and stuff is that even on the lowest level of this bike, the most affordable one, you still get a 10 to 51 tooth, 12 speed drivetrain. That is phenomenal. You've just got lots of cadence options with this thing. And it is kind of like a race setup, right? This is a slightly slacker than the Super Caliber non-electric version, but it's still, it's, it's less slack than I'm used to. And if we look at the Trek lineup of electric bikes, they've got the Powerfly, which is kind of like their entry level mountain bike. They've got hardtail version or full suspension version. Again, you know, cross country trail kind of thing, 120 millimeter travel up front just like this and 110 in the rear, whereas this is 60 millimeter travel in the rear. So it's definitely shorter and it's just tight and snappy and quick. So it's definitely cross country versus you get into like trail with the power fly. And then from there you step up a little bit to the rail and that's more of like an all mountain, 160 millimeter front, 150 millimeter rear travel, heavier bike. It's gonna take those hits and just give you a lot more comfort and have that even slacker uh, head tube angle. So it's interesting to see Trek with five different versions of just their cross country bike. And another thing that makes this kind of racier is that they've got this dual lockout here. So with this, single trigger right here, you can lock and unlock both the front and rear suspension simultaneously. Gotta love that. These are both air, and this is Fox Factory 34, so 34 millimeter Kashima coated stanchions right here. You can raise or lower the air pressure on both of these, as well as adjust rebound down here with this little red dial. And then right here, there's a red dial there that has like 12 positions. So pretty cool to see that. Um, you know, a lot of times you have to reach down and physically lock it out, but if you're really racing and just go, 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 it's nice to have everything at your disposal without taking your, your hands off the grips, which is also nice here. You can see the Fatsua display panel, control panel thing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. This does not come with a dropper seat post. That's something I'm used to seeing on like the other trail all mountain bikes. And again, I think that's sort of a weight savings thing. Like you set this up, cross country doesn't involve like as much ups and downs. You just wanna have your body in the optimal position and, and that's what this allows you to do. However, they do have this really cool cable routing system with a big grommet here. You can see a little hex bolt in there. So you can take this off, you can route everything, keep it looking really clean and they give you an extra lever for installing a dropper seat post if you wish, which again, the 9.6, it comes with the dropper post, it's just heavier. And they give you a lever so that you can mount that directly to the lockout module as well. They are using the 35 millimeter uh, handlebar diameter here, another carbon fiber bar. We've got blender compatible stem, and these are also carbon up here. So you can add some of the Trek like computer mounts or light mounts if you want to do that. They've got knock block, which stops oversteer. So you'll see it actually like stops right there. It's not hitting anything. They're stopping it before that crown would interact with that down tube. Again, it's carbon fiber, but if you break the chip, like if you crash or really oversteer hard, they have this rubber protector right there as well. So it's sort of a redundant safety design, which is awesome. Again, anytime you're buying from like Track Specialized Giant, any of the, the big companies, Bulls too, you've got that support. You've got a warranty. You've got dealers you can go to to get some help. 
but it's still nice that they really designed this thing to sort of take care of itself. Tapered steer tube, boost hub spacing front and rear. So instead of 100 millimeters up here, it's 110. Instead of 135 or 142, we get 148. So it's wider, it gives you that stronger spoke bracing angle. Just 24 spokes on these, they are bladed, very narrow, aerodynamic, lightweight. You're not gonna get that on like the lower levels of this bike. This, this is just the fanciest version, but they are still boost. And you still, you get that 15 millimeter through axle, 12 millimeter in the rear. And that sturdier bracing angle is gonna give you the same sort of stiffness that you get on like a 26 or 27.5 inch wheel, which are kind of being phased out, 27.5. Everything's sort of going back to this 29er. It allows you to get that rolling momentum once these are up to speed, lower attack angle, just to overcome obstacles really easily and still have a good amount of air volume um, without you know, expanding that contact patch. So it might be a quick, quicker steering experience and also just less drag. So that's really cool. No quick release on these. This is a six millimeter bolt front and rear. However, there is a really cool little tool that they include. I'll try to get it out. This thing is magnetic and it just, it just stays right there in the rear. And you can use that to release the front or rear wheel if you need to do trail maintenance. Very cool. Another just little thing from Trek you don't see on this bike but they have like a derail your guard on some of their other bikes that's really nice just really clean it's something that i see on the cheaper e-bikes because a lot of times they're being shipped in the box and they don't want the derailleur to get messed up this one being assembled and received from dealers not really a problem but still you know again they're, they're going lightweight here there's no tabs for adding a kickstand there is no kickstand so here we have bottle cage bosses that's nice you can mount uh, a folding lock or or water or something like that. I'm wearing just a basic backpack and a lot of times when I'm riding, you know, you have a camelback hydration pack of some sorts. Really nice saddle, Versa Pro, lightweight, very comfortable, carbon rail. So again, so many accents here being carbon fiber, really lightweight, nice. These are like silicone grips. The brakes being XTR, we have adjustable reach, but they also have adjustable free stroke which lets you set the brake pad contact point. So how far do you have to pull those levers for the brake pads make contact with that rotor? It's not something I see a lot and nor have I really adjusted that here, but reach is nice when you've got different size hands or maybe you're wearing gloves or not wearing gloves. It's just gonna position this just perfectly for you. Okay, now we're looking at the non-drivetrain side. So the derailleur and all the sensitive bits on the other side, the right-hand side. The left side of the bike here we can see these awesome disc brakes uh, corresponding to those levers that we were talking about up here, 203 millimeters up front. That's great because your weight sort of shifts forwards and you want that good mechanical advantage to slow the bike down and then cool efficiently. So aluminum alloy core and then carbon steel rotor with this nice bladed design. This is Ice Tech from Shimano, designed to be you know just really cool and lightweight and efficient for high-end bicycles and even e-bikes like we see here. XTR quad piston caliper, so it's it's a longer uh, braking surface and it's just gonna cool faster and apply more pressure with this heat sink design here. So that's gonna dissipate heat like you might see on the inside of a computer on top of a, a CPU or something. It's really neat to see that technology on a bike. Same caliper in the rear with the heat sink and quad piston, but we have a smaller 180 millimeter rotor versus the 203 up front. And I think that makes sense. It, it works fine in, in my experience, and I haven't really been racing this. This is really overdone for the type of riding that I usually do, but gosh, is it fun. I mean, again, it's just snappy. It applies that pressure to move you forward. You're not losing a lot of speed and, and power in bobbing. Um, and again, you have that immediate lockout, so it's done very well. You can see right here as well, there's like a magnet to measure rear wheel speed, and you've got pedal cadence and pedal torque here. So this is a multi-sensor with, with the drive unit. Um, it feels pretty good. It doesn't have shift detection like some of the Bosch systems, and it still does apply up to 55 Newton meters of torque. So I am easing off so that I'm not, you know, chewing up those teeth on, on the cassette or just, you know, hearing that chain like clunk around and mash. Um, so it's, it's a good design and it's all really tight. We don't have like a spoke magnet hanging out on one of these bladed spokes. Uh, again, just really nice um, up to 50 psi by the way i really wanted to to point that out because it says on on both this carbon rim and the tire if you go above that you could damage the the carbon rim and that would be a bummer 29 by 2.4 
that's the tire measurement right here. And I, I don't see any extra, you know, there's no reflective sidewalls and, and puncture protection. I'm not really sure. Uh, Bone Trogger is Trek's in-house hardware brand. And you'll see that on like the seat posts, a lot of the handlebars and other hardware and the rims as well. So that's in-house stuff for Trek. Now on this side of the bike, we can see a keyhole for removing that drive pack. And to me, that's, it's not placed perfectly. Ideally, that would be on the drivetrain side of the bike because you really don't want to lay the bike down where the derailleur can touch the ground, all the sensitive bits. Ideally, you'd lay the bike down like this on the non-drivetrain side. But when you do that, you can't really get to the, the battery core very easily. So you'd have to get the keys and get under here and try to find it and could potentially scratch the frame. And that's just kind of a bummer. I've been working with the battery with the bike in a standing up position like this, but that creates some risk too, because the battery can drop out. It, you know, it weighs six and a half pounds and it has actually fallen all the way out. Um, I've practiced this a couple times. We're gonna go through this real quick. This is the plus code ABIS keys. And it's nice, they can be key to like to maybe a folding lock or another accessory. I hear that that takes a little bit of time. You gotta wait for them to sort of send off the code and get the, the locking core sent back. And some of the shops are like, ah, oh, we don't really love doing that. But it's a nice feature because who wants like tons of keys rattling around in their pockets? On the other hand, how many people are actually be using a bike lock with this bike? This is more of like a recreational get out to the trail. <laughs> One of the things I love about it is that it fits in my car rack perfectly and it's just so easy to lift this thing up. Even if you don't take the battery pack off, a 36 pound bike is pretty reasonable. By comparison, the equivalent super caliber non-electric bike is about 20.5 pounds. Okay, so you're, you know, it's, it's still like nine and a half pound difference, uh, you know, f with with the battery pack out. That's with with using this, right? So 30.1 pounds if we're using the empty sort of shield thing or 36.6. So there's still some weight there. And I just think it's like the two and a half pounds down here and maybe the longer top tube. And I, I don't, you know, it's hard for me to know exactly where that weight is coming from. Maybe just reinforcing the frame for that extra power. But anyway, we'll get back to the battery here. So the key is inserted and you gotta kind of get it in the right position and then twist a lot. And I think maybe that's set now and then push up on this. And this is where it's fallen out for me before. Yeah, it just kind of unlocks it. I thought there was like this stable, there we go. Okay, so see it's, it's holding right now, but just barely, just barely. I don't know if you can see that. Um, I love that you can just push this thing in and straight up lock it once the key is in, but getting it out, it just be careful because it could easily tumble out and it has for me. And now it's not, but I guess, there we go. Okay, I'm trying to be really careful. And see, while I'm doing this with one hand, the bike is starting to, to tip and I don't want to scratch this thing. I mean, it's so beautiful. So let's put that down for a second and just line this back up and show you the, the guts. You can see the carbon fiber weave and some of the wires and stuff. There's like some glue going on. And then there's the bottom bracket, kind of like the gearing system. And as you cycle the pedals, look at that, the drive shaft doesn't turn in this backward. It's got a little bit of like a resistance, which is nice so they don't spin out of control. But in the forward position, it actually spins. Gosh, I wish I could had extra hands here to like lift up the bike and then pedal. See that? So cool. So that is happening the whole time that you're pedaling. And their literature from Fasua says, there's no drag introduced, there's no reduction gearing, it's, it's free pedaling, it's not gonna slow you down. Like this thing is meant to be an acoustic bike and an electric bike, but there's clearly like some gearing happening in there for that thing to turn. So in my experience, like I'm not really noticing it, but there's, there's probably like a little bit of extra friction or something going on. Um, and again, here's, I'm gonna show you this thing. There we go, so I push down on that thing, remove it. It's just like an empty, hollow thing, perfect for like a sub sandwich or something. Okay, so that's the, and it comes with it. I like that they don't charge you extra for that. And then this is the actual drive pack. Very cool, same thing. When I first saw this, I thought, well, dang, what happens if the battery breaks? Do you have to buy a new motor and battery combined? But no, this is what the battery, looks like right there. So this is the drive pack. It's got an interface down there for, for the battery to sort of plug into it. And there's that shaft interface for the bottom bracket right there. So the battery is 3.2 pounds. 
This drive pack without the battery in it is 4.2 pounds. And then that bottom bracket transmission piece is 2.88 pounds. So it's kind of interesting just to see this. And when I think about that 3.2 pound battery pack and just the size of it, it makes me think I could, you know, I could probably pretty easily stuff it into my backpack and carry it along. I think Fatsua also has like a hip pack or something like this. And they even have a frame bag that's designed to hang from the top tube. But I'm not sure I would do that on this bike because there's not as much space because of this suspension design or, you know, rear pivot design here that it could just get pinched and just rattle around and you wouldn't be able to reach some of those pieces. And you'd probably be colliding with your you know, bottle cage if you added that, but still nice to see these things. And let's look at the specs on this thing. It's 36 volt, seven amp hour. So that's the 252 watt hours that we were talking about. But that's roughly half the capacity of kind of a standard battery. And there's a little like LED charge level indicator built in. And then the magnetic energy bus, Rosenberger charge interface. So like if you're charging that thing and you, you kick the cable or something, it's not gonna crack, it's not gonna break like some of the little barrel plugs that you see on the cheaper e-bikes. This is premium stuff. Uh, sometimes though we hear people at shops complain that the end piece that's magnetic, if it gets in the, the soil or just around the shop, you get like iron filings stuck to it. And sometimes it kind of like has to flip around to align. It can be a bit annoying at times and it's just a little bit more expensive. Uh, by comparison, the Bosch interface is just like a friction, rubberized, big, very distinct plug that you're not gonna mix up with anything else. Uh, but I, I imagine it adds some additional money. I mean, just the magnets required for, for that interface and this interface. Uh, for me, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a point of consideration because, you know, the, the charger's compact, it's lightweight, it's small, that's all great. But to get to this, to charge it, you have to take the drive pack off the bike every time. You don't have to take it out like this, so we can kind of put this thing back. Kind of line it up, snap it into place. You can charge it just like this, but you do have to take it off every time. You know, six and a half pounds, potentially dropping it, leaning the bike up against the wall. To me, that is annoying. I feel like you should have the key interface and a charging port on the right side of the bike, up high. Like that's, that's what a lot of the competition is doing. And I think about a company like Specialized that has the uh, SL motor, super light, and they have, you know, it's kind of like their all around electric bike, the Turbo Levo SL. And it has a, an even more relaxed geometry. It weighs a little bit more at 38.8 pounds versus 36.6 here. And it's just really not as optimized for like racing cross country as this. Uh, you have longer travel in the rear. It's not this ISO strut design. And so you're getting a bike here that's very unique and all these different choices and sizes and stuff. But the actual experience of charging it is, is kind of lame. Um, room for improvement for sure. This seems like another heat sink kind of thing going on to dissipate some, some uh, heat as you're riding. At least the, the weight is low and centered on the frame. And at least you can remove the battery. You can take that thing in, inside and charge it in a cool dry location. Extreme cold is going to limit your range. It sort of temporarily stunts these lithium ion batteries and extreme heat that can degrade the cells over time. So you want to keep this thing at least 50% charged if you're not using it and then avoid those extreme temperatures to really maximize the lifespan. I love that you can pretty easily get that standardized pack as a replacement over time as it wears out. And then again, the bike, even if the electric systems, you just never used them or they're somehow the batteries were stopped to making someday, which is highly unlikely given that this is Trek and they've got, they're using the same system on several bikes, like the Damani road bike. And speaking of that, I think the Damani, you actually have to like take the battery off and press, press the power button there in order to activate the bike. And so one thing that's upgraded here with the e-caliber is that you can turn the bike on right here from that display panel interface. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you that next. I'm gonna try to line the battery up and put that back on just as a quick demo of what that looks like. There we go. Okay, there's that first point where it should stay. This is ideal. This is what it's supposed to do. I've just, I've had it tumble out before maybe because I was pulling up too hard on this and you know, just, just be careful. I don't wanna see you break your battery because they are expensive. So there we go, it's, it's in place. And now the key doesn't really just come out right away. You have to kind of fiddle with it and then pull it out. And there we go. Now I'm gonna go into the display settings a little bit. 
before we do, there there is just a ton of detail about this bike. I spent a lot of time studying it and pulling specs from the Super Caliber as well as some like pre-release Trek stuff because this bike isn't out yet. There was like a press embargo and I talked to a rep from Trek, Travis Ott, great guy, really helped me out here. There's just a lot to say about it and, and I've done my best to get the details so that you know exactly what you're gonna get from this exact bike that I'm looking at, this like media bike. Uh, they, they will have an app, by the way, that isn't quite out. It sounds like it might not be out when the bike launches, but that will be a smartphone app. Sounds like April 2021, so keep your eye out for that. But just to interact with the bike as is, the battery's charged, it's locked into the frame. We come up here to this interface, and there's a rubberized button right in the middle that's tactile. You actually push on that kind of clicks you don't really hear it it's sort of a it's a hard button but this thing looks really well sealed against water and the elements and it comes back to that stealthy design everything's just really integrated and then you can see these led lights there should be five if this was completely full and the lowest level is this sort of like white or almost purple color uh, and then we have breeze green river blue and rocket red those are the three levels of assist which give you up to that you know, 450 watts, 55 Newton meters of torque. These can be dialed in a little bit if you use that smartphone app. The app is also going to let you do some GPS, like route planning, and it's gonna give you more feedback about your current speed, your top speed, your cadence, your calories burn, stuff like that. I haven't had a chance to use the app, but I have searched the app store for the Fazua Rider app, which is not compatible with this bike. I actually downloaded that and tried to sync it and then I tried to update the firmware and it would not connect with this bike. So if you're like me and you're just jumping right in, you're excited about it, you might have to wait for Trek's app. I don't know what it's called. I don't know exactly when it's gonna come out, but it sounds like you know, Trek will help you with that. And they, they got the dealers and stuff looking out. So in addition to those five LEDs, which they tell you your battery charge level in 20% increments, we also have this like orange or red box LED at the top. And that's sort of like a warning message, like, oh, your firmware needs to be updated. There's some problem with the system. Maybe it's out of calibration with the pedal assist settings. And that's another thing. You can take it to your Trek dealer to do diagnostics. This does not have a USB charging interface anywhere on the bike. And again, 252 watt hours. You don't have a lot of power to draw from, but considering that they do have a smartphone app and that it would give you a lot more feedback about your ride, that's something I'd love to see in the future. I mean, hopefully we have higher capacity batteries that you can tap into and then you can use your smartphone device to give you the extra trip data and stuff because this definitely leaves something to be desired. You just, there's nothing, there's nothing here. You don't know how fast you're going. You don't know how far you've gone. You have to use your phone app and that's gonna, it's gonna take the battery down a little bit. So I think that's kind of it. The interesting thing here is that this is just, it's touch sensitive. So I'm not actually pushing on it. When I first got it, I was like really pushing and I was like, ah, oh, what, it feels like it's not moving. And then, yeah, that was true. It, it, it's just a touch sensitive thing. The problem here is that when it rains, that touch sensitivity can kind of, kind of get messed up. And so I'm not sure how to do it, but there's a way that you can switch it to where the touch sensitivity doesn't, doesn't change assist levels, that you press that center thing again. You have to push down and tactile. Again, there's not a lot of click and it's not the most satisfying button, but I, I imagine it's just very rugged. And it's neat that they thought about that. Clearly there must have been a problem with like changing assist levels in the rain or maybe raindrops are falling and it's like changing your assist level and you don't want that. So good for them. They're thinking through this. To me, I'm happy to see that the Fasua system is is stepping up their game because it feels like it's a step behind some of the other drive systems that are out there. It's light. It's more powerful than it used to be and it's actually very satisfying to ride. It's fairly quiet. The higher cadence support is awesome, but not having like a little bottle upgrade capacity thing like Specialized does, yeah, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a bummer. Having to take the battery off every time to charge it, that's a big bummer. And it's just such a nice bike all around. I mean, it's like, so this is my message like to Fatswa and my thank you to Trek because they're, they're the ones that made it possible that, you know, they got this upgraded display where you can turn the battery on right from the handlebar. That's at a minimum, you shouldn't have to like mess with the battery every time you just want to go for a ride. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited to see how they can improve this thing. And for that much money, especially if you get the 9.9 .9 XTR, 11,500 bucks, uh, you know, that's that's just a ton. And I, I would expect everything to be just like perfect. And so they're getting there and it's a really cool experience. And then that 
ISO pivot design is, is really the standout feature to me. So with that said, I think I'm gonna get on this thing and do a little ride test. Okay guys, I'm in a neighborhood with some good hills and nice little off-road sections. Of course I'm in rocket mode, that's the most fun. And I want you to be able to hear that motor starting and stopping. It's very responsive. Uh, and, and I just love that it's got standard parts here. It's not like a tiny little chain ring or something weird like that. As I was descending this hill, I, I definitely noticed this thing is a little bit twitchier. It's faster steering, less so than the Super Caliber, but still, you know, it's just, it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit faster in that way, even with the 29ers. Love the braking power here, no problem. I'm gonna turn around. Definitely notice the limited travel in the rear. This thing feels just tighter, like I was saying before. Um, and that makes it feel faster. It feels like uh, a number of years ago, I had a hardtail uh, cross country, lightweight carbon fiber mountain bike. And, and that thing was very fast and fun. And this, this really brought me back to that. And I, I love that at least it does have that rear suspension. I think there's always that compromise of we're adding cost and complexity and weight to have any rear suspension. Is it worth it? Again, for cross country riding where there just aren't as many big rocks and hits. I like that they were able to do this with the ISO pivot system and keep that weight really low, but just give you that little extra bit of comfort. And again, the option to lock it out. So there's a little bit of a delay and I'm also hearing some phantom shifting going on and hopefully that wasn't from when I, you know, was laying the bike down. I've been very, very careful not to let that touch the ground. Okay guys, you're mounted to the seat post. We're looking down at that 32 tooth, narrow wide, lightweight chain ring, 170 millimeter carbon fiber cranks and then these uh, bone tracker pedals that Trek just tossed on this because it, it doesn't come with pedals. Uh, you can see that nice slap guard and then the 10 to 51 tooth of gear ratio. I mean, that's awesome back there with the XTR. It is in the locked clutch position. I'm going to pedal through. My goal is to show you how quickly the motor starts and stops and also what it sounds like and how quickly it can keep up at those higher cadence levels. So again, it says it can keep up up to 125, which is very impressive. That totally matches Bosch and Brosa and some of the other leaders in the space. You can also see the ISO pivot. Maybe you can see this bend and flex a little bit. I'm of course in the highest rocket red assist level here. there was a bit of a delay in the pickup there at those really high cadence levels in the lower gears. And I'm still getting some phantom shifting here. Bike must have just come out of tune a little bit. So now we're gonna go a little bit faster and try to exceed the 20 mile per hour top speed. Yeah, easily above 20. Not sure how fast we were going because the display panel is just so basic, but uh, it felt great, it felt fast. And now I'm gonna coast down this hill. You can hear that it has a really nice hub in the rear. You can hear that clicking zzzz. That's because the hub has more pawls and it bites quicker. Like when you start pedaling, there isn't as much delay. Beautiful day. It's definitely a fun bike to zip around on. And it's expensive, but you know, you do kind of get the two bikes in one with acoustic and electric. 
I'm a lightweight guy. I like riding. I'm getting exercise on this bike. It's a dynamic drive system. I could see having just like one bike to do everything. As long as you aren't gonna do too much, you know, big hit kind of mountain biking, I could see this working. And again, I'm a fan of like the really lightweight stuff that specialized SL that I called out earlier. And now this, it's cool to see this kind of stuff coming to market. One step above acoustic, but kind of a step or half step below the beefy electric stuff. I wanna do a little bit of climbing. I climbed this a second ago at an angle and the motor was, for how small it is, it was like, yeah, I'm feeling the torque. Like it's actually doing okay. So I'm not gonna take it head on, but uh, yeah, I'm in a low gear. Let's do it. I can definitely feel it. I can definitely feel the support. That was that was awesome. That was pretty good. I'm impressed. Lighter for sure. Any bike that's this light, you can just toss it around. You can wheelie the thing a little bit if you want to. I feel like I'm just gonna do that one more time here and see it with the sort of torque or multi sensing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Thanks so much for sticking around with me, guys. As I mentioned before, I've got all the details on this bike back at electricbikereview.com and a cool comparison tool. So you can see how this stacks up in terms of price and weight and, and others. There's also like some forums and stuff and I've got one specifically for Trek. So you can see what other people actually think, people who have bought this or bought other maybe comparable bikes or recent models from Trek. Uh, because I, I do only have like, you know, a few days or a week with these things and I do my absolute best, but it's certainly not comprehensive. And my goal is to just have this like, ad limited, really open, transparent community. So you can make a good choice, especially if you're spending this much, much money. But let's, you know, it's just so, so much fun to get out there and ride bikes. I hope this helps you. I hope you enjoy this bike if you get it. Kudos to Trek. It's really nice that they have like three different mountain models now and just something that's so fast. It's like a race car. So I love you guys, ride safe, and we'll see you on the next one.